Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're looking at a data set of uh, traffic at different times. Uh, we have a longitude and latitude from where the traffic is beginning and ending. And then we have uh, the time, uh, that a time of day uh, that the traffic is happening, and then if it's a weekday or not. And we're trying to predict the speed um, based on the other features. So let's hop into the notebook. Um, I'm going to use NumPy and Pandas for working with the data. Uh, we're going to do a little visualization with PyPlot and Seaborn. Uh, and then I will import from sklearn for pre-processing the train test split function and the standard scalar. I don't think I'm using min-max scalar today, actually. Uh, and then these are all the models we'll use. We're using a bunch of different regression models, and we'll compare the results of each one. All right, so let's go ahead and import that. Uh, and I'll load in the data using pandas.readcsv. We'll get the CSV file path up here. We're using the pghtrain.csv file, so I'll paste that in. Uh, all right, and let's take a look. All right, so here's the data set. It's pretty simple. Uh, only seven columns, 570 rows. Um, so, but let's get a little more information on it with data.info. And you can see that there are no missing values uh, in any of the columns. We also have no object columns. Everything is in numeric form. So we're ready to proceed. I'd like to start by visualizing uh, some of the correlations between the data. And since these are already all numeric, I can just uh, create correlations for the whole data set. Uh, I'll create a new pie plot figure with a figure size of 12 by 10. And I'll use Seaborn's uh, heat map uh, function uh, to create a heat map of the correlations. And we can get the correlations with data.core. We'll turn on annotations uh, so we actually see the Pearson correlation coefficients. And then we will uh, set the minimum color value to negative 1 and uh, give it a color map as well. I'll give it Mako. All right, and then we'll show. Uh, PLT, not PLF. All right, here it is. Uh, and we noticed something interesting here. Um, we have a 100% correlation here. Well, not percent, it's a 1.0 correlation uh, between from X and the 2X. And you'll see that from Y and 2Y also have extremely high, 0.98. Uh, aside from these two, there is not really any strong correlations between any of the other variables. It's just uh, 2x with from x and 2y with from y. Now, if we were dealing with a higher dimensional data set, if we had more columns on our data set, uh, I would co definitely consider dropping uh, one of these each. So maybe dropping from x, maybe dropping from y, or maybe dropping 2x or and uh, 2y. Because you can say that maybe from x is saying everything that 2x is trying to say, right? It's because it has such a high uh, correlation. Now, because we have such a small amount of data, this is usually not the way to go. Um, I actually tried this with a bunch of different models, and it seemed like dropping one of the columns actually reduced the performance, just because we have much less data to work with uh, in that, uh, if that's the case. But if we were dealing with a lot of different variables, it might be a good idea to drop uh, some of the uh, redundant features here. Um, you can see we have no negative correlations at all. Uh, everything is right about zero. All right, so let's uh, let's start pre-processing. So let's take a look at the data uh, one more time, and then I'm going to create a pre-process inputs function. It's going to take in a data frame. It's going to make a copy of the data frame, and then it's going to return the data frame. And so I'll call the processed version of the data x, and we will store the result from preprocess inputs, uh, passing in data uh, into x. And right now it's just a copy of data, um, but now as we adjust it, we can in this function we can see the result down here. So there's really not much preprocessing that has to happen. Um, the only thing that might be questionable is whether we should one hot encode the time column. Uh, because you could argue, if you look at this, uh, x sub time dot unique. See, there's only three different times of day. 
uh, and they, I believe they do refer to the hour uh, during the day. So it's definitely can be considered as an ordinal variable. Uh, the spacing between them is right. But because uh, there may be certain qualities of those times of day that aren't captured by just a, sing a simple continuous variable like this, you might want to consider giving each, ca each, uh, each value its own column so that the model uh, can sort of perceive them all as separate events. Um, however, when I tried this, some of the weaker, some of the more um, simple models did perform better, but uh, our overall performance across all models did go down. So it seems like uh, keeping it on as an ordinal feature like this um, is the best move. Um, I also tried encoding it as a one-hot uh, columns and keeping the ordinal feature on, and that also reduced performance. So this seems to be the best encoding. All right, and so I guess that means we should just split the DF because there's nothing else to do uh, into X and Y. So Y is going to be what we're trying to predict. That will be the speed column, so DF sub speed. And then X is going to be everything else except the speed column, so DF dot drop speed. We're dropping from axis one, so it's the column axis. And then we'll do our train test split. So train test split will get 70% of the data for the train set and the other 30% for the test set. And that will return four new sets of the data, which is X train, X test, Y train, and Y test. And we'll use the train test split function from sklearn. It takes an X and Y, specify the train size, like I said, 70%. Uh, it shuffles the data as well before it makes the split, which is uh, nice because we'd, like we we'd have to do it manually if we didn't use this function. Uh, and then we'll include a random state uh, to ensure that the shuffle and therefore the split is always done in the same way if we were to reproduce the results of this notebook. All right, and then I'll scale x after that. Uh, so if I run this now, uh, this will return, let's return these values and then get them over here. And take a look at x train. So right now x train, you see the speed column is gone. The speed column is now in y train. Um, and this is 70% of the data. The other 30% is in the test set. Um, however, the only issue here uh, is that we have um, we have not scaled the data. So maybe I'll show you uh, the benefit of scaling. By scaling, I mean if we look at the mean of each column, they're all over the place, uh, and the variances are all over the place as well. Uh, actually, these are quite similar, but we have um, this one's huge compared to the others. So, um, what we'd like to do is standardize them. Uh, we can do this with a standard scalar, uh, which will give each column a mean of zero and a variance of one. Um, and to do that, we'll create our scalar object. Uh, and we can fit the scalar object to the test, the train set only. So we, we sort of want to pretend we don't have access to the test set when we're doing this. Uh, and then uh, I guess I'll actually, before I actually transform the data using the scalar, I want to see how our models do without scaling. So some models are fine, uh, such as tree-based models. They don't really have a problem if the data isn't scaled. Because all that really matters is the relative uh, differences between the data. But some models definitely perform very badly if you don't scale your data. Uh, the, the difference can be huge between the, uh, the results. So let's do training now. Uh, training slash model selection. So we're going to use a whole bunch of models. Uh, like I said, we're going to use all of these. We have a linear regression, just simple linear regression. Uh, we'll do k nearest neighbors algorithm. Uh, a neural network or MLP regressor here, uh, support vector machine with a linear kernel, support vector machine with a radial basis function kernel, uh, decision tree regressor, and then our two ensemble models, which is the random forest regressor and gradient boosting regressor. Both of them use uh, trees by default. Uh, the only real difference uh, is that the random forest uh, builds trees in parallel and then averages the results at the end. Uh, and the gradient boosting builds trees in series. So let's, um, let's I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a dictionary down here called models. 
and models is going to map the name of the model to the actual instance of the model. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to copy this in. Uh, we have the name of each model that I just typed out, uh, and then the actual instance uh, that we can now fit. Uh, and you'll see that I actually I spaced them so that uh, we can line them up and write the scores next to each other. All right, and then uh, for every name and model in models uh, dot items, so dot items will return the key value pairs as tuples, so that we can iterate through like this. Then we'll call model dot fit on x train and y train, and we'll print out. Uh, just a confirmation message that said the model was trained. So I'm saying name and trained. So we run this. You can see all of our models have been trained. It was fast, but we really don't have much data uh, to deal with, so it's understandable. And then we'll we'll uh, <laughs> a question. We'll we'll um, display the results here. So for name and model again in models uh, models dot items. I will print out the name of the model followed by R squared score and display the R squared score to five decimal places. So R squared score is a measure of how dispersed the data is around our fit uh, and it's a really good way of getting an idea of how our model is uh, regression model is doing. Uh, so we'll format this with model.score uh, which for for regression models in sklearn, the score function here will return um, the R squared score, and we want to evaluate the model on the test set. So I'm passing X test and Y test. Uh, now we can see all of the R squared scores for each one. Um, so let's let's copy this over, because I want to see which of the models are affected by scaling and which are not. Um, so you can see. Uh, it looks like our random forest uh, is performing the best uh, by far with a 0.61 R squared score. Uh, next best would be gradient boosting, then decision tree. And it seems like our tree based models are doing quite well uh, compared to the others. Uh, we, we, the others are performing more or less the same. Uh, the highest value you can get with R squared is 1.0, uh, but it, the uh, lowest value is it's, it's unlimited. It can keep going uh, net more and more negative. Uh, but these, so these are just about zero on all of these. Um, so now let's see if some of these ones uh, get imp improved when we scale, because we know uh, the tree-based models aren't going to be affected by scaling, most likely. Maybe I, I, I don't think they'll be affected at all. But let's see. Um, X train and X test. I'm going to scale both of these using the fit we have to the train set. So I'm using scalar dot transform. Uh, and then in the top we're transforming x train, in the bottom we're transforming x test. Now if I run this, you'll see uh, we have a numpy array because the transform function returns uh, in a numpy array form. So I'm going to turn them back into data frames after so that we can retain the nice look of the data. Uh, I want to keep the indexes the same. So uh, index equals x train dot uh, index, and column names is going to be x train dot columns. Uh, on the bottom here, I'm going to change it to X test. All right, so now if we run this, we have the data frame back with the columns and indices. Uh, and the data has been scaled. So if we look at the mean of each column, they're all extremely close to zero. And the variances are all extremely close to one. So the, the scaling is complete. You'll see Y train has not been scaled since we want to keep these as our label, our target values. All right, so let's retrain the models and see how these do now. All right, um, and OK, wow, look at this. It looks like Random Forest is, has actually gone down in performance after scaling, because we had a 0.61 before, and now we have a 0 0.60, which is very interesting. Um, huh. That, yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, in addition, we have a slight improvement to our k-nearest neighbors algorithm. Uh, this actually went down in performance. The linear kernel uh, went down in performance. Now, our our RBF kernel went up, uh, not by too much though. Uh, decision tree went up. Gradient boosting went up, but random forest went down. That's very interesting. 
Hmm. Wow. Yeah, I'm not sure why that is. That's interesting. Um, I I tried this earlier and I got a higher value with with a uh, random forest. So it's it's giving me different results now, uh, which is really interesting. Um, but uh, across all um, runs of this, no matter what I tried, tweaking all uh, bits of the the features and then the scaling, um, it seems that random forest just outperforms all the other models uh, by quite a bit. <coughs> uh, so that will sum up today's video. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.